in the last lecture i talked about the idea of the integral in a broader sense as something which pertains to our times and i posited an integrative impulse we also considered how sri aurobindo developed an integral practice as a kind of philosophical problem or existential problem which had to be solved through his own yogic openings we saw how this was accomplished partly through his entry into the indian yogic tradition so before we look in greater detail at that first formulation of the integral yoga that i touched on in that uh, lecture which is called the seven quartets or sapta chatushtaya it would avail us to consider the indian yoga tradition as it impacted sri aurobindo particularly the schools that he drew most from and we could go in a kind of a chronological fashion as far as his own engagement with these traditions are concerned or we could go in a chronological fashion in terms of the historicity of these traditions uh, i am going to proceed through the second approach but as we consider the different traditions that have emerged in indian yoga uh, we will also think about how sri aurobindo encountered them and what was the engagement uh, in terms of his own uh, life and practice so if we are to think about the uh, hi historical yoga tradition the earliest layer of yoga that we know about for sure as a textual base is what is known as the vedic civilization and its texts the vedic uh, yoga texts so the vedic civilization is roughly taken to go from 1500 bce to about 900 bce and we find that this tradition had been sort of downplayed by scholarship at the time when sri aurobindo encountered it it had been downplayed from the viewpoint that it had been considered to be a ritual literature uh vedic hymns were used in rituals and this is how it was seen by the indian tradition itself as well as by western scholarship there was no real philosophy to it nor was there any deep symbolism that one could extract from it or that that could one could extract a philosophy from but sri aurobindo encountered the veda at a slightly later stage after first encountering the upanishads and the gita but he was already practicing yoga and he was having certain experiences including contacting certain forces and beings or rather being contacted by certain forces and beings which he could not explain until he came across the veda so sri aurobindo tells us this in his text called the secret of the veda which is one of the books he wrote as part of the arya that we discussed last time which he uh, uh, edited and wrote for from 1914 to 1920 uh when he encountered the rishards um in pondicherry so secret of the veda or rather at that time called on the veda the name was changed later uh was something where he began talking about the importance of the veda and drawing out a symbolical system which one could see as being extended in later writings this is what made the veda particularly important 
And also one can explain through this why the Veda is really considered the root wisdom text in Hindu traditions. Uh, it makes more sense to see that there are uh, esoteric meanings that uh, continue into the later texts. So when we consider the uh, Vedas, uh, we can think a little bit about its historicity. Its historicity is debated, uh, hugely debated at this time. Uh, but we will follow a uh, scholarly uh, conjecture, uh, what is uh, taken by mainstream to be the historicity. So there are four Vedas. Uh, these are uh, the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atharva Veda. When we say the four Veda, we mean actually not just single texts, but we mean entire classes or volumes of text. The Rig Veda itself has 10 volumes called mandalas, and similarly, the other Vedas have got numbers of mandalas. What differentiates them is their function. The Rig Veda contains these uh, hymns or poems uh, that are uh, to the various gods. The Yajur Veda contains a lot of the same hymns and a few original hymns. And uh, Rajus, uh, sorry, Yajus uh, has to do with uh, Yajna or sacrifice. So these hymns are related to uh, sacrificial uh, ritual. The third Veda called Sama Veda also has a large number of the same hymns, but they are set to certain microtonal recitation patterns. And Sama literally means song. So these are uh, functionally related to uh, chanting and singing. And the fourth Veda called the Atharva Veda has a large, uh, many more uh, original hymns other than some repeated hymns uh, from the Rig Veda. And this, these hymns are of a variety of nature, including uh, hymns related to magic, uh, occultism, and even witchcraft. So we find that uh, these are uh, texts that uh, overlap and whose historicity can be thought of also as overlapping. Uh, modern scholarship holds that the Rig Veda itself is not uniform, not written at the same time, was written over a large uh, period of time. And from a study of the hymns, it is considered that Rig Veda volumes of mandalas two to seven uh, were written from 1900 to 1500 BCE. Uh, the remaining Rig Veda mandalas were written from 1500 to 1200 BCE. Uh, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and the Atharva Vedas were written from 1200 to 1000 BCE. And you had Atharva Veda, which is chronologically the last, containing a large number of original hymns, as we mentioned. Now, apart from these four major Vedas, there is another class of Vedic literature called the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are uh, also from the Vedic period and they contain uh, lots of stories as well as uh, uh, instructions for ritual. And they are also considered to have been written from 1200 to 1000 or so BCE. Now, a fourth class of uh, Vedic texts uh, sorry, we talked about the Vedas and the Brahmanas. The third class are called Aranyakas. And Aranyakas, Aranya means forest. So these are specifically what are called forest texts. And they have to do with the life of the uh, person who goes into retreat. Uh, we find that there is a notion of stages of life that these are connected with. 
and uh, in the Vedic period, it it is supposed that people had uh, their lives uh, divided into certain stages connected with the duties of life, or what were called purushartha, and these were uh, the student life when one learned uh, how to lead one's life, learned conduct, and learned orientation, learned proper, uh, you know, cosmology. Um, and this kind of a student life was called Brahmacharya. And during this period, one studied the Rig Veda and a, also various kinds of other <clears throat> uh, texts of conduct. Uh, when one became an adult, one uh, became a householder called Grihastya and the major uh, kind of works that one followed at that point were ritual works. So these are, one may say, more conducive to the Brahmanas, the Yajush and the Sama Veda, etc. And so uh, these rituals were related to the everyday functioning of life of the household as well as of the polis, uh, various kinds of functions were uh, mediated through ritual. Ritual was the symbolic relation between uh, the life of the humans and the life of the gods, uh, regulating uh, the entire life of the city as well as of the earth. So, at a certain point, uh, from about the age of 50, one started going to the forests to spend periods of time in hermitages or in uh, various kinds of retreats. And at that time, one encountered these forest texts known as Aranyakas, where there was some more depth uh, perspective given to what one had studied before and to the more ritual orientation of the earlier Vedas. Now, it is very possible that some of these Aranyakas uh, later became the Upanishads. Certainly some of the earlier um, Upanishads are Aranyakas and all the Upanishads are connected at this time to the Vedic literature to certain Ved one of the four Vedas. Uh, this is because uh, the Upanishads, which is a class of text that we'll be considering later, uh, become in a sense uh, connected to the Veda as the end part of the Veda. Therefore, they are called Vedanta. Anta means end, end of the Veda, Vedanta. Now we'll go to the Upanishads later, but just in terms of the historicity, we can note that the principal Upanishads are supposed to run from 8th or 7th century BC to about the 5th century BC. Uh, actually, the principal ones uh, up to about the 2nd century BC, but we continue having Upanishads uh, all the way up to about the 5th century CE. Now, if we are to think about the Rig Veda, which is the main Veda, the most important of the Vedas, called the Samhita. Samhita is the uh, the collection of the the hymns of uh, of of poems. Uh, we can find some consistency, and we can see some of this, which is drawn out by Sri Aurobindo in his work called On the Veda. Uh, the the, the ideas behind the Veda, the philosophical ideas behind the Veda or the metaphysics of the Veda could be called a panentheistic henotheism. Panentheistic means that the divine is above as well as below. Uh, it means there is a transcendence and an immanence. Uh, we'll get to see more of what this means as we consider the Veda in greater detail. Henotheism means the one has become many. The one exists in many appearances. Each one of these appearances is an appearance of the one. 
So we have many gods, but these gods really are forms of the one. We'll also see what this means in greater detail as we go along uh, looking at the Veda. Another important feature of the Veda, an innovation in world wisdom, one may say, is the relationship of cosmology and psychology. So here we find this is one of the major ways by which uh, human civilizations have transited from an animistic phase to a properly religious phase uh, in that we find that there is a sense of connection with the cosmos so that the individual, the human, is supposed to psychologically mirror the cosmos or the cosmic orders. So cosmology and psychology are related and psychology is really also a, uh, a, a extension of cosmology. A cosmology is a cosmology of consciousness. Everything is conscious. It is conscious all the way down. Moreover, it is not merely a kind of relationship. It is actually a duplication. One may say that the macrocosm is in the microcosm and the microcosm is equal to the macrocosm. So there is a notion of the duplication or reduplication of the cosmos in the individual. Now to look at the Vedas, we find that the Veda hymns are split into two zones. They occur in two kinds of spatial orders and these may be called their two points of view. And uh, for our sake, I will name these as heliocentric and geocentric. Heliocentric meaning that there is a view where the hymns are written from the viewpoint of the sun. And there are other, view, uh, other uh, hymns that are written from the viewpoint of the earth. The difference, the major difference being that the heliocentric poems uh, operate in a space of light. There is no duality. There's no night and day in the heliocentric hymns. They are in a zone of everlasting light. Uh, and in the geocentric zone, there are dualities. There is day and night. There is uh, life and death, etc. A third feature to these uh, two points of view is the connecting link between them. This connecting link is verticality. So that there is the notion of uh, a kind of a connection in the Atharva Veda. There are specific hymns to this, what in the Western tradition has been called the Axis Mundi, a kind of an axis that connects heaven and earth. The mythology of the Veda is a solar mythology. As I was saying here, we can see what is the henotheistic aspect of the Veda in that there is the sun and its emanations. In a way, all the gods are forms of the sun. They are relate, not only related to the sun, they are, they are, it, they are all the sun. The sun... Uh, in its light spreads across the entire cosmos and the sun has its emanations throughout the uh, cosmos. We'll see how the mythologies of the sun explain the workings of the cosmos. Finally, we have a relationship between inner and outer practice. Uh, we talked about the ritual aspect of the Veda and uh, up until very recently when Sri Aurobindo encountered the Veda, the idea was that this was ritual literature. But he was to point out that this ritual literature is something which mirrored psychological processes. Now this of course is not something extraordinary when we think about modern uh, psychology say Jungian psychology or even Freudian psychology for that matter, where rituals are understood as a kind of theater of consciousness, where psychological forces are 
in some sense being externalized or exteriorized. But this was the idea that Sri Aurobindo was drawing from the Rig Veda. So to go further into the cosmology of the Rig Veda as Sri Aurobindo saw, sees it, a reality is divided into two zones in a vertical relation. As we pointed out, one is the foundation above the heavenly realm uh, called Upari Bhutna. Uh, this is the solar realm of everlasting light. And the second is the realm of the alternations of day and night, Aho Ratri, who are sometimes called the two mothers or two sisters, often spoken of as a wheel. Now they'll be called the two mothers or two sisters when they are seen from the viewpoint of the sun. That is, when the heliocentric view is cast upon the earth, earthly realm, uh, we see that there are two mothers. The earth is experiencing uh, the fondling of the two mothers, uh, day and night, uh, or of the two sisters. The, it's a plaything of the two sisters, day and night. But when we enter into the earth, from the geocentric point of view, we'll see that there is a change and we don't see two mothers, but we see two contending forces, the forces of darkness that are, uh, you know, in a sense, robbers and evil, and the forces of light that are the gods. So we have to realize that there are different points of view that are being employed here. The Veda is not unequivocally a dualistic text. It is actually looking at various ways of configuring the same reality depending on what is the location of our consciousness. And this location of consciousness is mutable. It is mutable at the individual level as well as at the level of the cosmos. So, the cosmology is one of the sun being hidden by the demons in the realm of darkness and needing to be released. This is the view from the earth, the geocentric view. So this is how we see the three, uh, either the realm of uh, everlasting light or the alternations of day and night seen as two mothers or two sisters or into the geocentric realm where we see the operations of good and evil of uh, the demons and the gods and the uh, stealing of the light and its release uh, uh, through a struggle. Now each of these zones is further subdivided into three levels. So we find these are not sometimes named, sometimes they're called just the three luminous summits, Trini Rochana, and they're made of three elements, three dhatu. And this uh, heavenly realm is called Swar. And in the lower realm, there are uh, these three, there are three realms here too, or three zones, levels, called Prithvi, Antariksha, and Dyaus. So one is, Prithvi is the earth, Antariksha is the midward or life, and heaven or mind consciousness is Dyaus. Now these equations of Prithvi with earth or matter, Antariksha with life, and Dyaus with mind are Sri Aurobindo's equations. And we'll, we'll see how these kind of ideas, the ideas of the two zones, each one split into three, above and below, and relating to uh, things such as matter, life, and mind, are going to play a very important role in Sri Aurobindo's own uh, yoga, his own cosmology, and how he sees them extending from the Veda into the Upanishads and onwards. Of course, as I said, he did not come across the Veda at first. He derived these kinds of ideas from the Upanishads and then saw them in the Veda. These zones are inhabited by beings. In the upper zone, there is Aditi and the solar gods called the Adityas. Now, Aditi literally means 
one without a second. Uh, the single one without a second. And Aditi is feminine. Aditi is a goddess. She is the mother of all the gods. And we find that she is really the being who pervades the uh, solar realm. Uh, Adityas also mean the sons, S-U-N-S. -N and they are her sons, S-O-N-S. So the sons of Aditi are the Adityas or the sons and we'll see how these sons have a certain numerology connected with them that becomes cos uh, cosmologically significant. So these are the beings or denizens of the upper zone, Aditi and the Adityas, the solar gods. In the lower zone, uh, in all the three levels, there are gods, mortal creatures, and demons. So in the uh, un Prithvi, un Antariksha, and Dyaus, Dyaus is, uh, is the solar heaven of the gods. Uh, not the solar heaven, this is the kind of uh, geocentric solar. In other words, looking at upwards from the earth, we find uh, also subject to these alternations are the gods of, uh, of Dyaus. Uh, then the mid world, which is uh, the world that also becomes night, uh, is again a zone of uh, the gods and the flying creatures, some of the beings of the, uh, the mid worlds. And the earth is where we have uh, human beings, uh, animals, and we also have the demons who inhabit the same zone. Uh, this cosmology of consciousness is folded into each individual being as a psychology. In other words, here we find a symbolic language of psychology that can be experienced at every individual's life as well as in the collective life of the family and the community. The mythology of the Veda ties its cosmology and psychology together. Now, I read a quote from Sri Aurobindo where he explicitly talks about this idea of the microcosm and the microcosm being equated and how the Veda is central uh, to the Indian tradition, how he understands its importance in his uh, readings by the time he comes to write the Arya. So this is the quote, the sons of the infinite have a twofold birth. They are born above in the truth as creators of the worlds and guardians of the divine law. They are born also here in the world itself and in man as cosmic and human powers of the divine. In the visible world, they are male and female powers and energies of the universe. And it is this aspect of them which gives us the external or psychophysical side of the Aryan worship. But in man himself, the gods are conscious psychological powers. So we can see over here again, there are three ways to understand these gods. They have born above in the truth as creators and guardians of the divine law. In other words, these are the solar emanations in the world of Aditi, in the higher hemisphere, one may say, in the solar world. But they are also born in the world, firstly as cosmic powers. And remember the world is the world of dualities. In this world of dualities, they take on a dualistic form of male and female. So you have Deva and Devi. So these are the cosmic powers that are operating in the world. But then these are also psychological powers within every human being. The gods are conscious psychological powers. Now, what is this mythology? The mythology shows us as I said, a solar symbolism. The sun is the divine Gnostic principle and all the gods may be thought of as special appearances of the sun. The mythology uh, at the geocentric level is it shows us a play of dualities. 
there are, is the alternations of seasons, day and night, birth, death, and rebirth. So the alternation of seasons and of day and night can be thought of as cosmic uh, alternations. And the alternations of birth, death, and rebirth may be thought of as the uh, individual and psychological uh, alternations, mirroring the cosmic alternations. Now, there is a myth called the myth of Martanda, which one sees implied in some of the hymns of the Rig Veda. So he's sometimes called Vivashwan and sometimes called Martanda, the eighth son of Aditi. So according to this myth, we'll see in a moment uh, how uh, Aditi gives birth to eight sons, one of whom is still born and becomes the quote unquote dead egg. Martanda, uh, the word Martanda literally means dead egg. And this dead egg, which is nevertheless a solar product, it's almost as if the sun is burning within it, uh, but it has cooled into something that appears dead on the surface is the earth. And this is exactly what we inhabit as creatures and part of our um, work is to kindle this earth uh, in ourselves and as the earth itself so that it ascends back as the eighth son of Aditi in its solar firm firmament. So this is part of the mythological subst substrate of the Veda. Uh, another way of looking at it is talked about with regard to the descent of the sun into the earth. So we see that uh, people have spoken, scholars have spoken about the primitive nature poetry, uh, like a delusional kind of uh, imagination which sees the sun setting in the west and, uh, you know, believes that the sun is actually entering into the earth. But of course, this is a symbol symbolism. It is a symbolic view of the descent of the sun into the earth and of the capture of the sun by the forces of darkness and so that there is a battle in which the gods and the human, uh, in fact, all the, in the Veda there is really only the battle of the gods. The, the human is a carrier of that battle, one of the major powers or gods that um, uh, it represents the human in a sense, or whom the human represents in the strongest fashion is fire. And we'll discuss this in a moment, how important fire is uh, to world traditions and, uh, and how central it is to the uh, Veda. Uh, so really the, the sun is released by these forces called like Indra, Vayu, Rudra and Agni. Uh, we'll see in a moment what the positions and functions of these gods are. And they are helped by solar goddesses, uh, Saraswati, Ila, Dakshina, and Sarama. Now, I may say in passing that, as I mentioned, Sri Aurobindo's interest in the Veda was piqued from, from spiritual experience. Uh, he started having uh, experiences at a certain point where uh, the forms and names of certain goddesses would appear to him and he couldn't really understand uh, what they stood for or meant uh, until he found keys in the Veda. And these were the th four goddesses, Saraswati, Ila, Dakshina, and Sarama. As we'll see uh, later, these goddesses are related to intuitive powers, powers of intuition uh, that uh, connect the ignorance of the human mind to the solar knowledge of the Gnostic principle above. Uh, these these myths are uh, also translated into the structure of a sacrifice. So, and, you know, the, the, the central uh, sacrifice 
in the Veda is the fire sacrifice. So we find that there are these myths, uh, almost one may say that the myth, myth of the eight sons and of Aditi is like an idea image, almost a transcendental image that has not entered time, that when it enters time, it becomes a dynamic image. And this very same uh, uh, myth of the, of the eight sons as a dynamic image is the geocentric view of the diurnal, uh, you know, entry of the sun into the earth and the battle between the forces of, uh, uh, of the gods and the forces of the demons who want to hoard the sun in within the darkness. And we find that uh, the third view of this is the externalized ritual theater of ritual view of the sacrifice, the fire sacrifice in which these hymns are read out or sung along with various uh, offerings to the fire uh, who is called the priest of the sacrifice and really represents the human aspiration that is called upon to uh, bring down the gods, make their powers active in the uh, realm of ignorance or night. Now, fire hence is a central power in the Veda. We saw that the highest uh, god in the Veda, the only god there is in the Veda is the god of the sun, the sun god, the Surya or Aditya. Now, solar god is also a god of fire. This is a certain kind of fire, the original fire. The original fire, which is known in the Veda as Surya Agni or uh, solar fire. So this is uh, from the heliocentric view, we find that there is the solar fire. But the solar fire then enters into the realm of day and night. And when it enters into the realm of day and night, it has two major manifestations. One is the manifestation in the mid-world, and the other is the manifestation in the earth. Manifestation in the uh, lower heaven or in the geocentric heaven and in the mid-world are the gods, uh, and so the fire there is the fire of lightning. So we find that uh, Indra is the lord of all, all the gods, is the king of gods in a sense. He is the parallel of the Greek Zeus. And you can see the word Zeus has a close Indo-American resonance with the word Deus. Uh, which meant the heaven world of the of the geocentric realm, and uh, Indra is uh, the wielder of the thunderbolt, and so lightning and thunder uh, forms the fire of the mid world and the uh, geocentric heaven, and this uh, f fire is called Vaidyuta Agni. Vaidyuta literally means lightning and is sometimes taken to be electric fire. Sri Aurobindo calls it electric fire. Uh, it's interesting, the word Vidyuta as electricity uh, is used uh, in modern uh, Sanskrit and modern Indian languages, but Vaidyuta in the uh, ancient Vedic language uh, means derived from Vidyuta. And so Vidyuta at that point meant lightning. Now it can also mean electricity. Uh, Sri Aurobindo sees this as a uh, very ancient uh, knowledge of electricity as a form of fire. And then we have uh, earthly fire, which is uh, called the uh, material fire, Jara Agni, material fire is what we know as fire. So we can see these as the three transforms of uh, solar fire. So solar fire, Agni, the sun has entered into the darkness as the lightning 
and has entered into the earth, into material uh, objects and into the human being as uh, what we call fire, the power of fire. Now to look more closely at the solar mythology of the Veda, uh, in the heliocentric zone there is the sun uh, resplendent and uh, shining in the center as like, uh, you know, you, you may think of the sun as the Gnostic principle. It is like the center of the circumference-less circle. Uh, it is really the gathering together of the consciousness that is spread through infinity. So it is like the presence of the one uh, at the center of its uh, infinite extension. Uh, and you, uh, we already talked about the kind of power it has, which is the solar fire or Surya Agni. Uh, in this zone of the fire, we hear of a number of, of sorry, of the sun, we hear of a number of uh, solar deities. Uh, they are all, all forms of the sun with different functions. We talked about the mother of the gods, Aditi. We talk about the sons of Aditi, the Adityas. There are seven Adityas. And we also talked about the eighth son uh, of Aditi, Martanda, uh, which literally means the dead egg. Uh, she, out of which comes the words like mortality uh, in the Indo-European language. So Martanda is the son of mortal mortality and it is the earth. Um, there are also other forms of the sun. The sun is often referred to as uh, having emanations of what are known as the four solar kings in the early Vedas. And these kings are Mitra, Varuna, Aryaman and Bhaga. We'll see how some of these terms, particularly the term Bhaga, becomes very important in later times. In Sri Aurobindo's reading, uh, when he uh, interprets these uh, hymns, he saw the predominant uh, sense of these uh, names, uh, some of which uh, carry into modern times in India. Uh, Mitra meaning love, Varuna meaning vastness. Varuna is the lord of the ocean, uh, like Neptune in the uh, Greek uh, slash Roman mythology. Uh, Aryaman meaning force. Arya is going to be the root of Arya, uh, from which comes the word Aryan. And uh, so we can see that uh, the term Arya, which later gets hugely deformed in modern times, so that it's almost, there's a phobic quality to the term itself in modern civilization. Uh, is related to the root sound rij, Arya. So this re, re sound or rij sound stands for uprightness, stands for something which is straight, Strand stands for the verticality that connects heaven and earth as a straight line. So Arya Man means literally the one who possesses this kind of riju or rhythm, uh, which means uh, the, 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 the law of right. The term right, in fact, comes out of this Indo-European root. And the fourth uh, is king is Bhaga, and Bhaga is the lord of bliss. Uh, so we have these four kings, love, uh, fastness or wisdom, Aryaman is strength or power, and bliss being the four major uh, emanations of the sun god. The sun god sometimes is shown with uh, daughters and consorts. Usha or Dawn is one of them. And sometimes we hear of Savitri because the sun god is also called Savitra. So Savitra's daughter or power is Savitri, a descendant of Sav Savitra. We have a famous uh, epic that Sri Aurobindo wrote called Savitri. We hear of Savitri and the story of Savitri in the Mahabharata, 
But Sri Aurobindo is claiming from the etymology of the terms that it is really a Vedic uh, story that is lost to us at present, but comes from the Vedas. If we think of the geocentric realm, we find that this has uh, the highest uh, zone or level called Dyaus or heaven in which Indra is the Lord of Thunder who wields the electric fire, Vaidyata Agni. And he is the one who has these female agents uh, who are the four uh, goddesses that we had talked about earlier. Uh, the goddesses of intuition. And these are Ila, uh, who is the goddess of sight or revelation, divine sight or revelation. Saraswati, the goddess of hearing or inspiration. Sarama, the power of penetrating intuition. And Dakshina, the power of discrimination, knowing what to choose, how to choose right. So these are four goddesses that are aiding uh, the, the Lord of Gods, Indra, in the darkness to prepare the grounds for the release of the sun, of the power of divinity that is locked in the darkness. Uh, Sri Aurobindo is actually going to use uh, these terms but not these uh, names of the gods and goddesses very often. But if we uh, know these, uh, this background, we can see how these gods and goddesses and how this kind of an idea uh, enters deeply into his work. The techniques used by the Veda uh, we know the most common technique of the Veda is the ritual or yajna. And the yajna itself is a spiritual uh, technique. Uh, it, it continues to be used. Now, uh, if we, we find the, uh, the use of uh, pujas, which are not the same as the Vedic ritual, but often include the component of a ritual, of a Vedic ritual, a fire ritual within them. But even otherwise, the yajna or ritual is a dramatization of internal processes and can, uh, through its external engagement of the senses, uh, can replicate certain internal processes, can make certain internal processes uh, trigger in one. Uh, another technique used is visualization. In visualization, we can see that uh, the goddess Ila and all the various symbols are really visualization emblems, things that we can meditate on as in, in a visual form. And we can also see how uh, in the Vedic uh, theory of uh, reality, uh, one of the highest faculties of the divine is sight. Uh, one may uh, sort of talk about this as the sight and hearing uh, being the two great greatest faculties, sense faculties of the divine in the Vedic uh, view of things. So internal visualization actually leads to an entire uh, path of the purification of vision and the rise or ascent of the power of vision to a uh, kind of a pure seeing, a seeing which is the seeing of the sun god himself, the seeing of Surya, the helio heliocentric sight. Uh, another very important power is the power of sound. So here the Veda is supposed to be mantra and Sri Aurobindo was very interested in this particular aspect of, of Vedic literature. Uh, because he was a poet by, uh, by, by natural proclivity and uh, he had a keen ear for the suggestive power of sound. So he is trying to f sort of ask this question as to whether the power of the, what is the power of the mantra? And is it possible to write the mantra in modern times 
uh, not I mean, uh, to have the same potency as the kind of mantra that was written in the Veda. What is the potency of the writing of the Veda and can that be replicated in modern languages? This is his entire project which he uh, theorizes in his text called the Future Poetry and which he practices uh, to uh, the greatest extent in his epic called Savitri. So this is why he's very interested in the power of uh, the mantra that is being talked about as the, <clears throat> the incantatory power of the Vedas. Uh, another uh, power, that technique that is being used in the Veda is the geometric symbol. As one can see, there's a, <clears throat> a, a, a kind of a numerology, a very powerful numero uh, numerological uh, system. Uh, not a single system, but a very flexible system. But the whole notion of numerology is uh, very uh, active in the Veda. And so we find that this numerology is also related to geometry, how numbers can be configured into shape or form. And this geometry is something that appears within the ritual uh, in a visual form uh, due to the various altars and their shapes uh, in the ritual. Uh, this is going to develop further into the entire realm of the yantra or the geometric uh, engine or motor of uh, yoga in a visual form, the diagram of uh, spiritual practice. Uh, finally, you have other yogic processes which may have come from other uh, sources uh, than the uh, Indo-European sources. They may be forest pra practices that the Indo-Europeans encountered at some point of their journey uh, uh, and settlement uh, in the northwest of India. Uh, so these, these are uh, breath practices and we can find the importance of the wind god, uh, Vayu, that is related to breath. So we may think of uh, disciplines or practices of the breath uh, that existed at the time. Uh, practices of aspiration, which are central to the Veda itself, because we saw how fire is really the gathering of our own aspiration from within. What prayer is just one aspect of that. This is the very essence of prayer. It's a concentrated word, wordless prayer in which all one's energies are gathered and sent to some uh, some some uh, unknown being and even one may say unknowable being to give us the connection with the uh, heliocentric realm. Okay, so this is the power of fire and fire has the power to do this because it is of the same nature as that heliocentric uh, uh, power. The essence is the same. Uh, then a third process is the process of developing intuition. And this is the power of Indra. And this is what Sri Aurobindo was doing, which is why we encountered those, those four goddesses that I spoke about. Uh, at that particular phase in time, he was uh, making his mind uh, receptive to the power of these goddesses. Uh, the mind has many layers, as we'll see as we go on in Sri Aurobindo's uh, psychology. And though at a certain early stage he experienced what he called the nirvana, uh, there were uh, sort of there were superficial, uh, you know, films of consciousness that he needed to work on. And particularly, he was interested in developing a system or process for which he was uh, drawing on the help of these uh, beings uh, and processes. So if the, the mind can be made quiet and opened to these forces from above, 
uh, that are intuitive in nature so that the mind becomes intuitive. This is what Sri Aurobindo calls developing an intuitive mentality in his later writing. And then there are processes related to Soma and these are uh, voiced in a whole class of hymns to the, the Soma. The Soma is a kind of uh, uh, substance and it could be a psychoactive substance that was supposed to bring bliss and in fact Soma was one of the powers we can see Bhaga as the power of bliss and that power of bliss is manifest in a material form in Soma. So this is the path of delight. Just as one may find the path of fire or the path of will, you also have the path of delight which is traveling through Soma. Now, before ending with uh, this, uh, uh, the Vedas, uh, it is important to consider some of the really important ideas or hymns and also some of the important, uh, you know, uh, verses that have carried from the Veda to into our times. Uh, one of the most important and also in a way notorious hymn of the Veda, notorious or infamous, not because of itself, but because what has happened historically uh, out of that hymn is what has been called uh, the Purusha Sukta, which is the a hymn uh, number 90 in the 10th volume or 10th mandala of the Rig Veda. So in this Purusha Sukta, there is the, the notion of a kind of a theistic divine. It is no longer being called the sun. This is not a hymn to the sun. And this 10th volume, many people believe, scholars believe, is a later volume. So the language, the symbolism seems to have changed. And we suddenly have this notion of a anthropos. This is not necessarily uh, human, uh, but the root of the human. This is the, uh, the, the, uh, the purusha, the person. This is the quintessential person. So Purusha is the supreme person. He is all that is and all that will be. Uh, Three-fourth of the Purusha remains unmanifest. So you can think about this being as almost that axis mundi, which is uh, infinite unknowable above an infinite unknowable below. This kind of an image will appear later in the Puranas and Shiva will be equated with that, uh, that pillar. But this three quarter above, which is uh, not known, is uh, a way of saying that only one fourth, only one quarter of this divine, this is part of its numerology. And we'll see later how these four are divided, but it's the fourth part of the divine that decides to fragment itself, that decides to sacrifice itself, sacrifice itself in the, in the, in the idea of the creatures of the world. Okay, so there, is no, there are no creatures really, but it will sacrifice itself and become the creatures of the world. So this one quarter becomes the manifest cosmos. Now Purusha calls the Devas, Devas are the gods, and in a way the gods are emanations of the Purusha himself. And so he, they are the divine beings that come and do this sacrifice. And from his face or mouth, so this is the a quote, uh, the Devas sacrifice Purusha bringing about the cosmos and the creatures. Uh, from his face or mouth came the Brahmanas, from his two arms came the Rajanya, known as the Kshatriyas, from his two thighs came the Vaishyas, from his two feet came the Shudras. Now these four names are the four names of what are known as the castes in India today. So let's read on, but this particular just single line from this particular hymn has been taken to 
uh, establish the caste system in Hindu society. Uh, however, this has to be seen in a symbolic light first. It has to be first read in terms of its psychological uh, place in the uh, Vedic mythos, which is the mythos of the uh, reawakening or uh, re-arising of the sun. So the, the fifth stanza says uh, it becomes cosmic, just as these uh, four uh, divisions are divisions of the multitudes of uh, types. You know, we can see these four types. Uh, then we have uh, cosmic powers being born. From his mind was born the moon, from his two eyes was born the sun, from his mouth were born Indra and Agni, from his breath was born the air. From his navel was produced the Antariksha, space between earth and heavens. Dhyuloka, or heaven, came into existence from his head. The Bhumi, the earth, evolved out of his feet. And Deek, or special directions, from his ears. Sim similarly, the demigods produced the worlds too. So here we find that the space uh, of these uh, divisions is being created. The cosmic conditions or the cosmic boundaries uh, are being created. Uh, you know, the moon, the sun, uh, and these two uh, primordial gods, uh, the two other forms of fire, electric fire and earthly fire, uh, they become the principal uh, allies of uh, the human and the creatures uh, the mortal creatures that are born are born uh, in this form uh, related to these four powers and we can see what those powers are because they are anthropo anthropomorphized they are related to parts of the anthropos so because from the face of mouth came the brahmanas it represents knowledge from the arms coming the Kshatriyas, they represent power. Uh, from his thighs coming the Vaishya, they represent his uh, bliss or love. And uh, from the feet coming the Shutras, represent labor or uh, skill. So these are the four gods and you can, the, uh, the four uh, castes. And one can see how these may harken back to an earlier uh, core of the Veda where you had the four kings, uh, you know, of, of, the, of Surya, Mitra, Varuna, uh, uh, Aryaman, and Bhaga. And these also are related to the uh, various uh, parts of the body of the uh, the regions, uh, the parts of the cosmic regions, the space between earth and heaven, the heaven world, uh, and the earth. See, so they are, they, we, we find that these four uh, take up their places in the cosmic uh, verticality, you may say. So this hymn uh, is a very interesting hymn. And, uh, it, you know, if it stop for a moment to think about it, it we actually get the sense in this hymn of uh, a kind of an origin hymn, a creation hymn. This is really a creation myth. And the creation myth in it is that of uh, the self-dismemberment of uh, the divine person. The self-dismemberment of the divine person is a kind of multiplication in terms of certain qualities. So we have these four major qualities, just like the sun, uh, it's a quaternary uh, at the center of which is the sun. And this quaternary is uh, made up of these four powers of knowledge, power, love, and skill, or some kind of earthly uh, control, earthly power, power of material skill and material uh, service. So these are the four kinds of uh, qualities through which uh, the solar power manifests 
on earth and particularly in people. This does not mean that it is hereditary or that there is a hierarchy to it. All it means is that there are soul qualities and the soul qualities are not necessarily, um, you know, kind of fixed uh, in, a, in a kind of a uh, way which is archetypal, that there is only one kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, quality that is manifest in each, because as a matter of fact, uh, it is the sun itself that has dismembered itself. And so the whole of the sun is present in each of its parts. So the, these parts are qualities in the sense that there is a certain range of, uh, of consciousness, uh, of a kind of consciousness, uh, which forms the, form the boundaries of the nature of this particular manifestation, but within that, everything else is also contained. This, in a sense, if we are to look at the work of Gilles Deleuze, is what he calls perplication. Perplication is the way by which everything, in a sense, is folded into each thing. Uh, though something may be predominant and may appear, uh, you know, in a certain way, in a, along certain qualities. So this is the way in which uh, manifestation uh, spreads according to the Veda. And the fragmentation that takes place is something that is a dynamic process of becoming one. So it's as if the one uh, sacrifices itself into four, uh, so that the four may sacrifice themselves to become the one. But it is no longer the one or not the one that became the four. This is a new one. It is a new one because the four retain their fourness and yet become one. Because the one in becoming the four does not stop being one it still is the secret one that contains all the four and that is in each of the four. So we find that the four can discover each other uh, in each of themselves as well as form a, a, a collective unity, discover what it means to form a collective unity and a manifestation which is the manifestation of the divine polis. So this is really uh, how I read this and how Sri Aurobindo reads this esoterically uh, in terms of the uh, history or evolution of creation itself, starting from a kind of uh, multiplicity and moving towards a new kind of unity, a unity of multiplicity, unity, which is uh, another name for the multiplicity. Now we can see four important mantras that have carried into the future and into our times. One is a mantra of plurality, which is really the most important mantra of the Rig Veda. Uh, it all uh, lots of Indians, all Brahmins are supposed to recite this. Uh, it is recited a number of times in every uh, puja. Every god is invested with this particular mantra in his own name. Uh, and this is uh, a mantra that relates to the sun god. And it is the mantra called Gayatri. And it goes, Om Tat Savitur Varenyam Pargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhiyo Yona Prachodayat. And its translation is, We meditate on the most blessed form of the sun god, Savitra. May he illumine our intelligence. So here we find that in an uh, interesting way, uh, the central uh, quintessence of the Veda is given the highest importance and continues to be uh, seen as the most important uh, statement and mantra uh, in the Indian tradition, in the Hindu tradition. 
And it is really talking about this solar Gnostic principle and how the solar Gnostic principle is being asked to illuminate the mind. So may he illumine our intelligence. And here exactly we see that there are these uh, correspondences, this correspondence between the intelligence and the solar Gnostic principle uh, as a kind of lower double. And how can one move from one to the other? And this is exactly the calling of those powers of intuition, building the intuitive mentality by opening the mind, the intelligence to the solar Gnostic power. Another very important hymn uh, in the Rig Veda is the mantra to Vishnu, which one finds in many uh, pujas. And uh, this mantra says, Om Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam Sada Pashyanti Suraya Diviva Chakshu Ratatam. Uh, Vishnu is a solar god. And Vishnu uh, occurs a few times in the Rig Veda, but whenever he occurs, we know that he is another name for the sun god. He is the spread of the sun god's light through the sky. And so we find that uh, the word Vishnu itself means uh, spread, to spread, to um, pervade. So Vishnu is the pervader. He pervades all the worlds. Nothing can uh, stand in his way. And he kind of crosses from the lowest uh, underworld to the highest heaven uh, in a moment. And so this is the spread of the solar light, which when it, when it comes into the earth's skin, there is no pl place that is left uh, hiding. It spreads equally all over the earth. So this is the uh, notion of the heliocentric realm uh, you know, Vishnu is seen as the source of that spread as well as the spread itself. And so as the source of the spread, he is the master of the heliocentric realm, the sun god. And we find that this hymn is saying that uh, salutations to that Vishnu, whose supreme station the gods behold at all times, like an eye wide extended in heaven. So this is a conscious uh, center of the circumferenceless circle, the concentration of the essence of uh, the, the, the infinite uh, being, from uh, infinite being. So we find that this uh, being, this is the center of the heliocentric realm, and all the gods who are emanations of this being are uh, revolving around this being. And even from the zone of uh, day and night, the zone of the dualities, the gods look up uh, always at this particular center. So that is what is being talked about. So we can see here, uh, coming down to us to this day, a clear reference to the heliocentric zone, the zone of the sun. And one, one has to realize here that, uh, you know, there is a myth uh, that uh, what is what we call the heliocentric uh, notion or the heliocentric uh, view of the cosmos was uh, discovered by Copernicus. Uh, but this is uh, not really true. The heliocentric zone existed not only in India, but also in the West, long before Copernicus. There were two ways of viewing uh, reality, uh, the cosmos. One was the view from the Earth, and one was the view from the Sun. And uh, both views were held to be equally uh, valid, not valid, but uh, practical because each was a certain kind of, of uh, uh, relation uh, with reality. The third really important uh, mantra is the mantra of plurality, uh, and that is uh, ekam sat vipra bahudha badanti, which literally means there is one truth the wise people.